actually I caught up with him a little bit um, first time in a while. He got burned out. Um, I forgot he's he's by I forgot what area, but in California, um, up a bit, not quite Bay Area, but um, so yeah, it was like six weeks ago. I think, or, or more recently, his house burned and they're out. He and his parents. But um, what did he say? Oh, he was really optimistic. He said he said that they have um, another 25 years now to rebuild and be clear because it burned so thoroughly that there's no danger of any fire coming for another 25 years. So that was like a really bright thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> the fires have been so frequent and furious in California especially that Aren't, aren't areas that just burned last year kind of difficult to light on fire again? Or are they just charcoal and they want to light on fire again? Because wouldn't there be natural fire breaks from the large fires? And, I, you know, once you've burned enough, uh, it should be like you're not burning that much more. Crazy. Doug, are you, uh, are you near fires now? Uh, yes, about five miles. And so we're covered with smoke and soot. Uh, and before you worry about me, we're on the river. So the river is always a way out if needed. Uh, but so mm -hmm. far, I mean, it looks pretty good at the moment. But California, I think, historically always burns. Uh, it's all going to burn at some point. And we are not building as though that fact is known. That's true. But it seems like, it seems like the intensity and frequency has, has jumped. No question uh, about that. No question. Yeah. 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 Anyway, a sobering start to our call. Sorry, it's uh, it's crazy. So this is the OGM check-in call for Thursday, September 10th, 2010, 2020. Ooh, how did I do that? Uh, and how did a decade just slip by? Um, uh, let's do a let's do a. a a breezy check-in to see who's who's here and how we're doing. Uh, let's start with Charles Scott and Rob. Breezy check-in is it's it's a uh, perfect weather over here in Zurich. Um, light breezes, cool, cooling down quite a bit at night. It's definitely heading into fall, um, but these are the kind of last days of summer. We had we had a bunch of rain for a few days, and the temperature dropped like 15 degrees. It was you know quite, quite abrupt. And then um, it's coming back a little bit. I, um, it looks like tomorrow um, with my kids and their mom, we'll have a picnic by the lake and do some swimming. And hopefully the water won't be really freezing. And um, so that's a bit of seasonal stuff. And um, I don't know, just swimming in all this uh, Kiko Lab flow show stuff. It's been really incredible explosion and um, been wonderful to have you, Jerry, and others here from OGM, Judy's here, and, and uh, I, I didn't look who else is here now so far, but um, yeah, there's been a You're wonderful funny. cross pollination uh, happening. So that's probably enough from my side. We're organizing our newsletter and a bunch of goodies to share on Monday, which is the, the final flow show of the first uh, series. And um, onward, the collaboratory, key collab. And we should probably sort of uh, dig into some of that and find out where there's more points of, of collaboration and, and all that, how we can be more effective uh, together. That, that'd be a great place to go back to once we've checked in. Yeah. Uh, and one, one thing just to, to place it is the discourse that we start to talk about. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Um, Scott, Rob, then Hank in his new digs. Hello, everyone. Um, from Interlock in Michigan where we are surrounded by water. And uh, I don't know if it's good that we're immune from what's going on, but um, it's always a reminder when I hear everyone's check-in and all the things are going on. So, um, so uh, one thought for this week, I was thinking about how to navigate the, the right and the left and, the, and, and what, how do you describe yourself? And, the, the idea came to me this morning that I'm a member of the, the free collaborative party. And it was just a, just a, a sketch of an idea. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if there was a, a definition of some other kind of, again, an alternative, a third way, if you will. Um, so that's all I have for this morning, but uh, I'm well and 
I hope the rest of you uh, continue to stay safe. Thanks, Scott. I love that. And I, I have a t-shirt that says Team Human on it that I got a, a couple years ago when I attended in Portland, the World Domination Summit, uh, which was kind of all about just like being on Team Human, which is a, maybe another nice approach. Uh, Rob, uh, Hank, then Julian. Yeah, good morning from Washington, D.C. It's been uh, raining uh, very strongly last night and into today, so it's a little, a little gloomy out. Um, a lot of our work is, uh, my company's work is with the federal government, and I don't know if people know there's a pending government <coughs> shutdown. Um, doesn't get any news, but uh, it'll probably get worked out. But uh, end of September is when the U.S. government fiscal year ends, and so if they don't approve a budget, uh, then then the government shuts. Um, a bunch of random things get shut down called non-essential and a bunch of random things are deemed essential which really are not that essential uh, so uh, but most likely that will get sorted out um, i appreciated scott's quick comment there about the third finding a third way i think on my mind quite a bit is our political system in the u.s the the polarizing two-party system i think is very broken and not what we all intended to to be like and i think the financial system is broken and not what we all want it to be like so i i've been spending time thinking about those and they they feel both um in insurmountable but also i'm somewhat of an optimist that things things do change um, i'm reading a book called a gentleman in moscow and it takes uh uh, goes through uh, kind of the Russian Revolution, and in a, a split of a moment, they renamed cities and streets, and uh, you know, for better or worse. So, uh, change. I'm not I'm not necessarily recommending that mode of change, but uh, change can happen. So uh, that's that's what keeps me coming back to these calls is trying to find people that agree that change can happen. Um, and then a last uh, bit, I was on a call with some very corporate types, including the former uh, CEO of IBM. And uh, I'll have to paste in the name of the group. I forgot it up to my tongue, but they were using the term uh, collaboratory. So I was uh, thinking of, of uh, Charles and, and Lauren and some of the folks here. So uh, I thought that was very, I guess a, a term that could pick up some, some usage. Um, so that's it for that's it for me. Love that. Thanks, Rob. I, I was just marveling this morning that there's like fires all up and down the West Coast on top of pandemic, on oh, top yeah. of re-election, on top of economic collapse, and it's just uh, wacky. Um, Hank, Julian, then Hamilton. Yeah. Good morning, everybody from the New Digs. Um, I'm still not completely settled in. Right. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm jazz hands on myself too. Every time I put something away, even if it's like a paper towel, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of in that. <laughs> in in that phase. Um. So uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think I have been. Um, I spent some time catching up on the call last week because I was kind of a little like mentally in and out of it. Um. And so, uh, so that was good. Obviously, like still love to hear all the conversations kind of going on. Um, have been talking to some folks uh, from this call, but not on this call about, you know, some of the topics that have come up just to kind of dig a little deeper. Um, you know, as, as you guys know, these check-ins are awesome, but we kind of sometimes can like, you know, be the, be the rock skipping on the top of the pond when there's, you know, the whole rest of the pond to explore. Um, so I just, small plug to encourage everybody to to continue to do that and if you want to reach out to any of uh, to me or anybody else um, please do so um and i think just a moment of kind of synergy you know i've been also just kind of thinking a lot about you know it's an election year um, obviously the divisiveness that that can show up um, is rearing its ugly head i found myself reading um reading the Federalist Papers or just going back and reading some of those. I was reading Federalist Paper number 10 recently, which surprisingly is a, well, coincidentally is about factions um, and how, you know, democratic republics are supposed to theoretically be able to, you know, 
uh, not not necessarily control them, but be a, an antidote. Um, and so I'm just kind of, I think, sharpening my chops, digging back into into papers like that, just to kind of think, you know, what were the theoretical and philosophical basal motivations behind, you know, some of the ways that we're supposed to have discourse here um, that seem to be sometimes working and sometimes drowned out. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Julian Hamilton, Judy. So good morning uh, from dim, dark orange, California. S since last week, I've been focusing on the, the ACM SIGGRAPH history knowledge base. And uh, this is addressing the history, the, the past and future history of computer graphics, uh, one of my primary projects, but I've actually been getting the description together. It's based on, first off, having a lot of legacy databases that, to deal with, which are actually still living databases, moving into a triple store. And if you're familiar with the brain, it's kind of like a baby triple store. But in this case, I'm going to be using uh, something bigger like Neo4j, Allegro, Graph Agents, Graph, one of many. And that this is discussed in the report I'm working on. And then the other thing is how do you address it? Because this knowledge is no good if you don't have a reasonable way of getting into it. <clears throat> uh, however, for me, it's not something that you do through a screen. It's something that you do through using the immersive technologies. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, discuss this in more detail, that's better left to a separate session that we can arrange. Because uh, it's, although it's relevant to OGM, it's not exactly on topic for this call. Um, also, I'll be bugging out at eight because at, there's a fireside chat between Dean Alman and Jim Handler, who are two of the biggest names in semantic web technologies. And that one, that's gonna be a good session to be a fly on the wall. That's Are there any immersive, I'm just curious quickly, if, what's, the, what's that mean? What, so if you've heard of uh, virtual reality or augmented reality or some, yeah. whatever reality, that's all sure. immersive tech. Got it, okay, yeah. Cool, um, thanks Julian, sounds really cool. And you made me, you made my brain want general purpose friendly AI that's on our side that can crawl history spaces and all these other spaces and help make sense with us <clears throat> to do all that. It's like, that, that'd be a great day. Um, let's go Hamilton, Judy, Mark. Hi guys, welcome from uh, all of a sudden sort of cool and rainy Boston. Um, my old digs in Boston, not Hank's new digs. Um, uh, we are still, let's see, here in Boston, we're still uh, 11 days away from school starting, um, which means 11 days until my kids start looking at different stuff on their computer screens than they have been for the past six months. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, the fun that we're living through. Uh, you know, a lot of client work. It's really exciting. I think every, it's just really busy. September is, it's interesting to see that even in a pandemic, September has a business to it. So that's sort of comforting in a way, even though it's exhausting. Um, and uh, the fun stuff I'm working on, working with Peter Van uh, and Amber Case, uh, who mentioned some of you guys by name the other day, Lauren, yes, you. Um, uh, we're working on a 45 minute video for uh, Cybos this year. Uh, it's our InnoTribe video. Uh, it's featuring uh, Ann Pendleton. Uh, she was on our first call and uh, some work she's doing with John Seeley Brown around imagination and uh, the next level beyond design thinking, which she calls designing for emergence and scaffolding and a lot of stuff that you guys I'm sure are familiar with. Uh, so it's, I am a, it's fun. I get to be a student while doing work um, and I'm drinking from the fire hose from Ann and JSB. Uh, so that's me. Awesome, Hamilton, thank you. Uh, Judy, Mark, Kevin. Sorry, I needed to unmute. Um, yep. Just busy trying to sort the information flood that I'm digging into on various topics and spent some time yesterday with Pete getting some instruction on how to better organize things. Um, so it's, it, there's just such an inundation of information and I'm trying to translate it and simplify it to take to the groups I work with who are failing to some extent in their communication modes. Love that. My, my handle these days on Twitter is Coral Polyp in the info torrent, which is really clumsy, but that's kind of how I'm, how I wish I could feel because right now I feel sort of lonelier than that from the information curating side, but I'd like to be collaborating with a bunch of other polyps moving nutrients through and feeding each other and, and, and that. So I want to head there. Uh, Mark and then Kevin uh, and then uh, oops, Ken. 
Yeah, I wish I wish I could. Uh, that's that's from my balcony. That's not a background. Nice. So that's Oakland, and uh, nice we don't. Well, yeah, you know, nicer nicer than yesterday. Yesterday was eerie. I mean, I, I felt. I'm really starting to feel that old combination of um, the fires, COVID. Yeah, you mentioned the election um, and all these like kind of, kind of getting heavy and heavier and heavier every time we talk about it. Because like, you know, it's nothing changes really. And it's up so slowly that it becomes, you know, not even noticeable, really. This being said, there is lots of great things happening in the world, so should celebrate that too. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm right now working on still the same things. So focusing on um, indigenous people, they're preserving their traditional knowledge and uh, and systems. Um, and and yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Mark. And I would thanks. love to build some bridges to some of the community communities that you're um, helping. So that, that it would be interesting to think about how we might be more helpful to them in some way that it's actually useful to them right now. So, um, and, and thank Mark, you. Mark, I, I wonder. It looks white behind you to us um, because of your camera. What color is? Do you see when you look in the sky? Ah. Uh, it's gray. <laughs> yesterday so was orange. orange, like completely yeah. orange. Yeah, yesterday was just like The Road, a book by Cormac McCarthy. I don't know if you've read it. It's like you, you have to read the end. Like I read it in three nights. <laughs> I couldn't wow. stop. But it's, uh, it's that. Is that what you see? Yeah. Crazy. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Kevin, Ken, then Doug. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> well, you know, I responded to a thing Hank posted on our <clears throat> website thing about what is OGM, and I said, oh, it's just discovery, that's all, and we do things offline, <clears throat> and I felt good about it, and then I realized, you know, I could be totally wrong, and I started thinking maybe it's, this is a, a collective intelligence platform, and as I mentioned, I've been reading a uh, uh, what's happened with uh, the Balinese water temples and collective intelligence, and they discovered that uh, networks can be both problem solving and self organizing. If you just know what the four uh, uh, rice pot patties around you are doing, and then the, the guy who's done it has started teaching at the uh, you know complexity uh, Santa Fe Complexity Institute, and I just realized you know maybe there is a an emergent permeable collective intelligence thing. I looked at some of the things Charlie Blass was doing. <clears throat> and then a, a really interesting wo woman named Zoe, who's uh, kind of the, the maven of a thing that she calls fandom, which is uh, the, what she thinks is the new uh, commercial economy. And uh, a, a great example of it is if, if you go to the Masters, the golf tournament, you get to buy things in that gift shop that are only there at that time. And people pay enormous things for them, not just to come home with the t-shirt, but because it's part of this bonding experience with everybody. And she's calculated how that's uh, also true in esports and everything. So there's collective intelligence. When I, when I was sure it was not that, suddenly I realized like, I, probably I was wrong. So that's all. We're trying to work our way up that ladder, uh, Kevin. Thank you. That's cool. Um, thanks for the link to Zoe as well. Uh, Ken, Doug, Tony. Good morning, um, evening, afternoon, wherever you may be. I am uh, in Santa Fe, not far from Oakland. And yes, yesterday was really eerie. Um, it was so dark at eight o'clock in the morning. I thought it was eight o'clock at night. And um, I'm currently house sitting. I drove up to Willits, which is about you know, a little over two hours from here on Monday to do some census work and I missed the first exit. So I went up to the north exit rather than the south exit. And as I was approaching, I saw this huge column of smoke and there was a, this is called the Oak Fire, which had just broken out two hours before I arrived. And within 45 minutes, I had five Nixel alerts. Nixel is a, um, for those who don't know it, it's a, you text your, your um, uh, zip code 
and any local fire police sheriff will text you emergency alerts. So I had five alerts within 45 minutes of arriving. They evacuated the town up until four miles away from where I was staying in the hotel. Um, my boss said, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay? You want to go? I said, if they're going to evacuate, I'd rather drive home now uh, when it's daylight and I can see where I'm going and I'm the only one on the road with normal traffic than be woken up at two in the morning with the entire town trying to leave. So I was a, a little 250 mile round trip for uh, not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of production up there. Um, one of my team members was actually trapped up in Laytonville, about 30 miles north. Uh, the road had been closed on 101 between Laytonville and Woods. She had to drive all the way out to the coast, down, one, down Route 1, uh, to get back to Fairfax and didn't get home till 1 in the morning. Uh, fortunately, the hotel manager let me go into her room and get all of her stuff. So I rescued her, her clothing and everything. But it's been a little bit hairy here. Uh, that was really my closest brush with the fire was, you know, to see this huge smoke, like literally about five or six miles away from the town. Um, and it just, uh, it, it's been really surreal. It doesn't even begin to cover what it's like living around here right now. Um, poignant thing, I'm, I'm house sitting for a, uh, in a, a friend's house that I've been coming here for 12 years to take care of their Australian shepherd who passed in March. Mm. And I keep walking around the house and seeing, you know, like expecting to see him around the corner. So I'm just, I'm feeling a little bit tender around that. I didn't realize how much I missed this dog. I've spent a year of my life with him over the last dozen years. Didn't realize how much I missed him until I got here and started to, to not see where he should be. Um, and then my wife just uh, wrote me that, that uh, Emma Peel has left the building. I'm, you know, I loved... Uh, Diana Rigg was such an amazing actress and I just feel sad that she's gone. So yeah, I'm kind of all over the map. Um, and on, on the really good side of things, my friend Avril Orloff, I invited her to join us today. I'm really happy to see her here and I'll let her introduce herself, but um, she's a phenomenal human being. I think will be a, a wonderful addition to this group and um, I'm happy to see everybody. I, I realize every time I get off these calls, how much, uh, these calls mean to me. I just, I love being on these calls. It's, it's, a, it's a, an oasis during the week of just feeling connected to people who make me feel connected. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, Ken, so much. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really poignant moment for so many, too many reasons right now, poignant and, and unfortunately dangerous. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and Avril, uh, welcome to the call. I'll be with you in, in just a moment. I'm working my way up my screen. <clears throat> and you were early. There was like a pre-party here when I arrived. It was, del it was delightful. Um, Doug, Tony, then Pete. Uh, Doug, you're muted. Doug, we can't hear you. Better. Yeah, good if I unmute myself. So I much think better. I've learned. <laughs> uh, the impact of this fire on uh, people of lower incomes, uh, people like carpenters and house painters that aren't able to work in these conditions, plus uh, the employment for a lot of such people is just down a lot. And the pain is incredible. Uh, and we live in a kind of cocoon where uh, we, between our, our neighbors, our colleagues, and the mall that we go to for food or whatever, we don't see the way people are living. And, uh, you know, I think it's worth getting in your car and going to what you think is the poorest neighborhood just to see what it's like. Uh, the two things that are occupying me now are trying to finish up a good version of chapter one of the book Garden World Politics which is a book about how to have a vision of where we might be going coming out of this on the idea that it's very hard to do uh, recuperative work if you don't have a vision of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so uh, chapter one is just about done and this weekend we'll start sending it out to a lot of interesting people and uh, encouragement is, is appreciated. Uh, Along with the book, I've been doing something kind of unusual, and that's trying to come to terms with the work of Bernard Latour, uh, Bruno Latour, uh, which is quite complicated, and I've been reading it over the years, but I feel now an obligation to really come to terms with it, because he is doing the work of figuring out how we get from the progressive, conservative, right-left political axes to something that's more meaningful. 
and he's really good at this. So that's what I've been doing. Thank you, Doug. And and when we hit thing nuggets like Latour and, and, and some of his work, I'm really interested in how we represent that back into the collective intelligence. And so um, that that's kind of like this open this open wish list conversation for OGM. It's like we 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 are each of us filtering so many interesting points uh, and so many interesting levers and tools. How do we feed them back into what we know together? Um, is kind of where, where I'd love us to go. Um, Tony, Pete, then April. Hi, uh, regarding this group, I've been thinking a lot about what is a story? Um, there's a, I, I posted on the Complexity Explorer's uh, Facebook page the question, what is a story? And um, that's a, I got a lot of, got about 77 responses so far. And it, uh, it's very interesting because basically, you know, when it's described here, I'm scratching my head saying, well, this don't fit in with how, you know, I can actually see it because I've got experience as a technical writer and it's just different. And the responses I got were very interesting. Basically, like following Miriam Webster dictionary, it says there's two types, gives two definitions. There are the first two definitions of a story. One is a description of incidents or events. And the second definition is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, often is a fictional narrative it gives. Now, uh, Gene, uh, Gene Bellinger had me walk through his CLD uh, diagram, causal loop diagram uh, related to, uh, you know, him eating breakfast and I forgot how the whole thing went, but, and his, he presents a story, a well-rounded, well-presented story that's basically a narrative to explain the causal loop diagram. Whereas I'm more, I'm not, uh, I mean, that's a causality related diagram. I'm more of a, having a background in a, activity related diagram in that regard that's like a data flow diagram and in that regard a story is who what, when where how and why so it's interesting to see that there's two types of story according to merriam webster and they fit in almost perfectly to give you a good, good giving a good conceptual understanding of what's meant by a story now i could switch gears and now i could understand what's <laughs> what, what people are talking about so that's what i did recently cool thank you there's so much around story, There's in, including plots, like the Ur plots. <clears throat> There's a couple thoughts in my brain about like, there are only this many plots in the world and every story is derivative from these plots, but the number varies wildly depending on who's writing the blog post. Um, let's go Pete, Avril, and Lauren. Hello everybody, uh, I'm in San Diego, California. Um, our fire is uh, four days old or something and 25 miles east of me. Um, we just get high smoke um, and orange sun uh, today looks like it might be white. Um, it's actually coming along. They're they're starting to contain it, um, so that's good. And uh, there's been some evacuations and buildings destroyed, but not too many. Um, I also read on the news today that uh, La Nina is coming this winter, so that means our our rain season will be shorter. Um, rain is in Southern California. The rain is only in the winter, basically. Um, uh, I've had a great week with talking with uh, different folks um, from, uh, you know, all of all of us and all of our friends. Um, I'm excited to, I've, I've got kind of a question for the group and I wonder if we might have time for it this call. Um, so um, five or 10 minutes, um, but I'd, I'd want to come back to it later. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Avril Lauren Romer. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Avril. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm on a sort of a low grade campaign to rename British Columbia because of it's not British and we're tired of Columbus, but uh, <laughs> not getting a lot of traction. Um, I'm just very interested to be here. Ken sent me this invitation last week and suggested that I might like to uh, drop in and see what you all folks are talking about. I feel like I've just walked into a very, sort of the middle of a very heady river. So um, I'm, you know, it's gonna take some time for me to catch up with um, some of the things that you're referring to and some of the acronyms and things like that. But um, what can I tell you? It's um, been a strange time here, just like everywhere else, um, but <clears throat> in different ways. Uh, obviously, some of the turbulence that's going on in the United States is not um not a daily not a daily a thing in our lives but it's um we experience the uh, reflected turbulence a lot and um 
you know, so I think one of our prime ministers many years ago said that, you know, we're like the mouse next to the elephant and when the elephant rolls over, the mouse gets squished. So um, what goes on in the United States is a, you know, big import to, to Canada. Um, so we're watching. Um, and um, me personally, uh, COVID has been um, a time of re-evaluation, rethinking, recalibration. I, you know, they say never waste a good crisis. And so I'm, you know, using this time to think about like, what do I actually really want to do with the rest of my life, whatever left of it. Um, you know, uh, uh, work has been slow and that's actually been kind of a boon um, as long as I can pay the rent. Um, I'm kind of happy to have this opportunity to reflect and to, and to think about like, okay, where next? And um, I guess the thing that's been occupying my mind a lot is, is relationship. Um, it's always occupied my mind, but now it's really front and center. And it's like, it feels like that's at the heart of everything, certainly that I do, but it's also, I think, at the heart of just how we get anything done. So I feel like that's, that's what's calling me for the next while is, you know, how to host hospitable space for human connection. So um, being part of hospitable space for human connection is a, is a great, uh, a great boon. So thank you very much. And um, I'll move back into listening mode now. Oh, thank you so much. Really glad you're here. And uh, we're just waiting patiently until your country accepts <clears throat> citizens of our country again. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody asked us to invade you. We, we may consider that. Uh, you are point. totally yeah. welcome. Yeah. Just make sure you come down as far as Portland. Yeah. Well, Portland's high on the list. We, so my wife and I call Portland the Canada of America. Yeah. Because yeah. the people are actually really nice. Like Seattle's much more like San Francisco, but Portland <laughs> is the Canada of America. We love that. Portland has um, my favorite store in the whole world. Oh, good. Uh, oh, Powell's? Of course. Yeah, we are walking distance to Powell's. We're oh, my God. <laughs> ten, ten, 10 blocks from Powell's, which recently reopened with lots of distancing and lots of whatever, but at least they're still alive. Um, Lauren Romer Stacy. Hey, uh, everyone. Uh, last week I mentioned um, because of uh, Kevin's work um, on a, a purchasing cooperative, I mentioned um, maybe making a purchasing cooperative for um, software, and people seemed interested. Um, but I don't have the time to actually put this together. I was just wondering. Um, if that might be a subject of discussion because I think we're desperate for it because software with the good fun software to work collaboratively is pretty expensive especially if you do it in a team and so I think that'd be a major step forward without having to make major decisions on um, global issues and stuff like that I think it'd be a huge step forward and Lauren, are you looking mostly at software packages that cost 30 bucks? Or are you looking at monthly payment software like Notion and all the other things that people are starting to use? Yeah, all of that. Okay, um, all, all sides. Also, if anyone is around here just sitting here thinking, God, I just like to help someone. Uh, I could really use some help on the collaboratory kind of getting stuff together because we're trying to, what we're trying to do is, um, basically create a learning pod that can be replicable that's based on collective intelligence. And so there are all these like little parts to think about like onboarding and conflict resolution and security and stuff like that. That's really difficult for me to organize and think about and coordinate. So any, if anyone is just looking to help someone out I'm over here. <laughs> Do you want to cool. mention just just a tiny bit about what is happening with the cool lab? Is that yeah, what we're to? Yeah, so we're actually trying to kind of go forward with practical collective intelligence and use a lot of concepts we're talking about, like decentralized governance and uh, stuff like that, to make uh, a learning pod for uh, kids and their parents or grandparents. And so. Um, we're actually trying to put something forward and get people involved and um, make it happen. So we meet every Sunday with these uh, kids, but it's really hard because the way we've designed it is to be intergenerational and us uh, and very accessible to all kids, um, no matter where they are and um, how much access they have. 
So it's that's that's pretty difficult design considerations. So that makes it inspiring and fun, but also kind of difficult. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, Romer Stacy Phelan. Uh, Romer, there you go. Good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Romer Benitez here from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hi, Lauren. Well, I'm, I'm just grateful to be with all these positive people here amidst all this uh, crisis going around us. And uh, to all our friends in the West Coast, I wish you all, you know, well. So take care out there. Yeah. Uh, what I've been doing right now, so uh, being a home daddy, I'm so much engaged with my kids' education right now. And uh, most recently, uh, I received a letter from the uh, superintendent where in currently my kids are on a hybrid program. So they go to school in person uh, twice in a week. And uh, the classes are cut into half and it's more of a cohort system. So which kind of minimizes the, you know, the likelihood of, uh, you know, transmission. So for us, that is okay. And that's our threshold of risk where we could, you know, uh, expose our kids. However, with the uh, recent letter coming from the uh, superintendent, the plan is uh, he will gradually uh, bring back the uh, regular schedule. And we're looking at few weeks away. And this concerns me a little bit because um, number one, the school is going to be a real good hub for a network where transmission could occur. And these kids, regardless of age, uh, I, I believe that you know transmissibility is going to be uh, way affected by this. So uh, with this concern. Um, I've been uh, looking at plan B of uh, uh, putting my kids in full virtual. And at the same token, I'm grateful with uh, Lauren and uh, Charles here with their project on Cool Lab. We are ex exploring that with them as well. And uh, I think this is a very timely project to you know, get going and see how far uh, these projects could you know, uh, move all these kids together. So uh, uh, while well, going back to my concern, uh, that is the plan. I'm looking at the plan B and uh, I am just concerned with certain decisions that are probably a little bit more premature right now, considering that we don't have even any vaccines yet or any answer to uh, this kind of situation. So bringing all these kids back to school in a normal schedule is probably uh, most likely going to compromise the safety protocol, which is keeping us safe right now. And it's a concern. So uh, I hope that uh, they can soon find a better answer. It's a huge concern. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm kind of surprised that there are not better distributed, better known plans for how to you know, divide and conquer and, and bubble and, and isolate and all that, because it sounds like you know, they're going through that phase now, but but they're getting overconfident is going to happen all over the place. Uh, sure. And, uh, and I think in terms of decision-making process, uh, it's all being, uh, our districts are empowered to do its own thing. And which is a good thing because everyone is, every place is different. You know, uh, uh, their infection rates are all different. But at the same token, I think the bottom line here is decisions are reversible, but the effect is not reverse, it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. So um, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Romer. Uh, lovely to have you here, thank you. Uh, Stacy Phelan and Matt. Uh, actually, go ahead, Stacy, and then we'll go to Kevin who raised his hand, but go ahead, Stacy. So I'm in New York and um, I've been mostly focused on a friend of mine's book, uh, Cognitive Politics, which has a workbook in it on how to engage with people from different um, political spectrums. Um, so I spend most of my time either keeping up on what's happening in our country, which is a lot, and uh, talking to people that I may disagree with very much, but trying to bring new perspectives or 
insert myself where things are getting, you know, really hostile on, you know, on the thread, mostly, you know, on Facebook is where I am. And just trying to bring out new perspectives and new ways of understanding people and get us back to, you know, being friends. <laughs> um, so it seems very simple, but um, that, that's where my head is right now. It's crazy simple. And it's just amazing how much we've been spun up. Like, like, like humans like to associate, humans like to collaborate, kids like to figure out what their role is in society. And I just started reading one of the articles in the flood of info passed me in the inbox this morning. And it was a New York Times writer who's saying, I, just, I think I just watched one of my friends go QAnon. And it started with you know, some articles and some hashtags and, and suddenly she was like going that way. Um, and and you know, this, this whole idea that we're all living in an alternate reality game and that there's a bunch of people so kind of playing game masters uh, and really enjoying uh, taking civilization in lots of different directions and uh, very intentionally, I think. Go ahead, Stacey. Well, one of my big focuses is on this whole idea of letting people see how the far extremes are actually meeting together because, um, because we're not talking and because we're fighting, we never even get to realize who's standing right next to us. So, I mean, it, it just amazes me that, you know, I know some very religious Jewish people and they are in total alignment with some white racists. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get them to speak so they hear it from the other person. Because me yeah. telling them <laughs> won't do it. So I just engage them in the conversation so they can see who they're actually dealing with from their own mind. Thank you. You're making me realize that uh, Zoom has a bunch of new filters, but they need one of head exploding, like little, mu <laughs> little purple, purple mushroom cloud just going up over your head. That would be like... Just, Duh, just to quickly chime in, just, um, yeah, to underscore this um, uh, extreme Jewish re religion, um, religious community networks um, supporting Trump, for example. And it, it happens here, too. There's a lot of expats in the Jewish community here. And it, it's just, I can't deal. But anyway. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, then Phil, then Matt. Yeah, just briefly, it's, I'm going to be leaving you. It's kind of sort of interesting, I think. Uh, the last time we were in Rome, Rosalie was speaking in the Vatican, we hired this group, Context Travel, to do tours with us. And they would give us a, a historian one day and a food writer the next. And we would, you know, really cool and uh, not traveling. So I'm, I'm doing a tour of Edinburgh Castle in 14 minutes with a historian. And so I'm going to be leaving. But, but I really recommend them. It's like 20 bucks. And these are people you would like to spend the day with and you spend an hour with. And they, they're, they're, they're walking through the castles or whatever. Anyway. It's a cool thing to do on Zoom. That sounds completely awesome. Can you share a link with us? It's, it's just yeah, I'll do the that, obvious sure. link. Yeah, please. That sounds complete. I love tours like that. They're fabulous. Uh, Fail in the net. Hi, guys. How's it going? Um, you know, it's funny because I think that where I want to land is where, where Jerry kind of left off. Um, vibing off of what Stacy said. It's, it's amazing. The place that I'm playing in right now happens to be there. Just that understanding that the divergent path just seems so attractive these days. You know, everyone, because of this crisis in sense making, seems to be looking for their own divergent path, something that makes sense. Can, can you guys hear me or am I stuck? You're, you're just fine. Yeah, yeah. And you're making way Hello? too much sense. So we're all, we're all like stunned Hello? into silence. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, do you hear us? We're hearing you fine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear yeah. you just fine. You are not hearing us. Oh shoot, we hear you. Oh, you hear me just fine. Okay, we hear you just like fine. This such a, okay, it seems like there's such a delay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and I think that a lot of the work that I've been doing and a lot of the way that I've been synthesizing these conversations and the inquiries that I've been making is how is it that we can create something where these paths connect, you know, these paths connect, like this whole intrinsic calling to do that we all have, you know, I think is being triggered because of what we're all just clearly sense making that there is 
th there's something underlying happening here that the people who are supposed to know kind of like don't have a finger on and it's going to take a collective effort. I think that's the intrinsic calling, this feeling that all of us have to rise to the occasion, to consume as much information as possible, to process it and to give our take on it. And I, as, as much as anyone might scoff about like a platform to do it or something to do it, I mean, we have like an internet, you know? Um, internet, I, and I think the internet was basically, sorry, excuse me. You broke um, up a little bit, go ahead. Okay, I, I know I'm talking a little bit uh, too much, but that's kind of like where my head is at right now. And um, I, I would, I would call that I, I would offer that we we really explore that as a phenomenon and to start thinking around how is it that we might kind of like bring it together a little bit, you know. Um. Phil, that's, that's really um, useful because you're making me realize, this is very strange. This check-in has triggered a whole bunch of things I wish we could do and wish we had. And what you just said has made me realize, I wish it were easy and, and customary and frequent for us to tell our stories to each other in ways that were easy to see, digest, adopt, enhance, elaborate, so that our favorite narratives were kind of at hand. Uh, because we don't, we, even with a quick check-in and some time together over these weeks, um, we don't really know the stories inside one another's heads. Like, like you know, they could be, they could be really different. Uh, who, who knows? And some of them are like really intriguing. We want to pick up and go, oh, I didn't know that. And then, uh, you know, check it out, absorb it, add it to our collection in some sense. I did a video a long time ago, sort of the, uh, back in 2010, called Nuggets, Narratives, and Points of View. And it was kind of the beginning of the story threader idea, but the, the concept was a nugget is any addressable little piece of information. It could be a, a tweet, could be a video, could be five seconds of a video, whatever. Um, a narrative is an assembly of nuggets that tells a story. And narratives can be retrospective, like how did we get here, or prospective, like what do we do now? Uh, and then a point of view is a collection of narratives usually within a domain, let's say education or politics or whatever, but these things bleed, bleed across. But, but the idea was, how do we make our points of view more explicit through these collections of narratives that are collections of nuggets? And that was just language I was trying to, trying to figure out <clears throat> around how do, we, how do we tell these stories with each other um, without everything being a, a 20 minute video. Right, which are, which are kind of impenetrable. Like, like listening to a 20 minute video is great, but there's lots of interesting nuggets inside of the video. Go, did you want to reply to that, Phelan? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I have been thinking about framing a lot and I think that it's in, it's, it's in the framing. Um, the, 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 the idea of pods, amazing, I think about that, but I think that the framing is something that we have to to really take a look at, not something that is prescriptive, but something that comes out of some type of um, amalgamation of our collective will and intention, you know, something stigmergic. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really generative. Uh, Matt. And you're muted. You know, yeah. it, the, the the estuary is rich today. Um, uh, uh, there's so many things that I've been thinking about and working on. And, and um, you know, first I'm I'm here in Boston, and I I feel um, I feel privileged to not be um, you know not to be dealing with the things that people on the on the other coast are dealing with. Although we're in we're in drought um, right now. Um, and, and it's starting and I have a feeling that um, everything's coming to a theater near you. So um, this is not, uh, this is, these are not idle concerns of somebody else. And, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that, um, you know, what happened that created the uprage after the Vietnam War was that television started to show the dead bodies um, and how little we actually see the dead bodies. Um, and um, see what's going on. And that comment of um, we don't see 
we, I don't know who the we is, we being the privileged, um, don't see the suffering in this world and, and, and right in our backyard. Um, um, I'm also, my daughter made a comment to me the other day about, um, she was talking about, you know, search in Google and, and looking for things that she's curious about. And she says, I don't like doing it because all I get is a bunch of ads. I mean, this is a 13 year old um, or actually a 12 year old and that, that they're realizing that our, our world of information has been corrupted. Um, and I just feel this sense that things are corrupted. Um, and, and that's, you know, that, that, that weighs heavy. Um, I also wonder about the tools um, and here we are on a hunt. Some of us are on a hunt to build new tools that allow new things. And if we only just got the right tool, do we get the new things? And um, in some ways that hunt is what led us into this, into this place. And so that's kind of a paradox for me as well. Um, and is this just more, just fundamentally just a much more human thing um, that we have to face each other and um, figure some of that stuff out. Um, and then I appreciate the fact that there's a lot of energy around the fact that we have a lot of energy and we don't quite know how to marshal that energy. And the last time we spoke, we said, um, I'm happy to bring collective next kind of group processes into you know, facilitating a, a meeting for us to, to get together. And so there's two things that we need to um, spend that concentrated time to maybe get ourselves over this get us over the hurdle to get more alignment that I think people um, are, t are wishing for. Um, one is to pick to some dates. Um, we, need to, we need to figure out when we're going to get together. And I would recommend, you know, the old school way would say it's, uh, in, you know, it's three days in a row. Um, they're long days and um, it requires a lot of learning and those sorts of things. I don't know if people can give that much time. Um, so I'm interested in how much time people are willing to give um, in a concentrated fashion to thinking about this. I'm also, Hank put something out there to say, well, what are, what would you want to achieve? And more importantly, I would just ask, what are the design questions that you have? So if everyone, you know, in discourse populated the design questions, then I can start to shape those into a broader set of um, objectives. And that gives us the kind of the heading for um, what we would do. So you know, please answer there um, what you guys think the design questions are. I'd rather not make it up on my own. Um, and, and then we can, um, we can find some time and, um, and just get us together. Um, and I'd like to do it in a way that we accommodate actually a global population, maybe even thinking about something that, um, something that runs continuously and people come in and come out of the process. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. So, um, that's that's what I'm thinking about, and I'm eager to help, um, you know, eager to help, um, you know, get this thing moving. Thank you, Matt. Um, a couple of things um, you mentioned Vietnam and film, and that was totally totally right because there were suddenly cam suddenly the nightly news had video of people under attack and dying in the field, and it was brutal uh, for the American public, and Vietnam completely knew that. Um, scrolling back to the Civil War, Matthew Brady is kind of the most famous photographer of the Civil War, and he never shot live, like you had to stand still for cameras back then, so he wasn't in the live action at all, but he showed up at battlefields and he showed uh, the strewn dead bot bloated bodies on the battlefield at Antietam and so forth. And before that, battles had been recorded by painters, mostly as a heroic mixed time record of what happened in the battle. So over here on the left is the attack on the hill and over here is the triumphant surrender and over here is whatever. And that was, that was kind of notions or you had newspaper drawings that showed up that when they started illustrating the newspaper. So nobody had actually seen the death like, like in the newspaper. And that was, that was brand new and shocking. It really, it really whacked people over the head. Stacy, go ahead. Yeah, the only thing I wanna say is that we're in a time now where people don't believe what they're seeing right in front of their eyes. That's exactly. not true. It's not real. So that's what we're, that's what we're up against. 
Well, we're in, we're in this moment of deep fakes where AI can sort of simulate and replicate and twist whatever's going on. We can make people look like they're saying stuff they didn't say. That's happening a little bit, not a lot, but that has created this general purpose skepticism about everything we're seeing, doubled up with a president who easily, without even blinking, will deny things that we have video of him doing and saying over and over and over and over right? Like insulting the military, like, <clears throat> you know, wh whatever you want. Like, there, there's plenty of evidence of him saying things that he will then point blank say it isn't. And this gaslighting is destroying our credibility, our, our ability to believe in um, the things we see, our, 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 our mediated personal experience, at least through things like, like images. But so to, that a... to that credibility <laughs> point, the way that we've helped is some of us have been so strong <laughs> and definite with our bias that the people on the other side, they don't believe us anymore. So they're not even seeing all these things because they're like, Every, you're always against him. You're, you're taking it out of context. And sometimes they're right. A lot of us have done that. <laughs> totally. I, I, I see it on both, I see it on both sides. I, I do. Yes. I, I wonder, I just real quick, I wonder about, um, and I know we have to keep these updates going, that that there is no more white space to create new sort of new versions of society, right? It used to be that you would go and you'd, you know, come across the ocean and you'd conquer the Americas and then you could create kind of this new democracy, you know, and, and I think about the innovation that goes on in the technical space because it's so, it's so, um, you know, there's always new white space, but we can't innovate social systems that quickly. And I just wonder if, OGM ultimately isn't a social system that's, you know, becomes governmentless and lives in its own space and has its own rules and and we we just step away. We don't we don't try to combat the chaos. We try to just create our own, you know, Xanadu and um, and and we have our own economy and we take our ball and we we go home. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know this is what Elon Musk is motivated by to get to Mars is he just doesn't believe that you can, you know, solve these problems and fight your way through it. And so I see, Ken, I see the, you know, the downward, but I, you know, I'm, human beings have been trying to correct themselves for, what is it, 50, 60,000 years? And we just keep making more of a mess of it. Um, it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting. So, oh, Matt, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Matt, you're the end of the check-in. So we're done with the check-in round. Unless I forgot somebody, uh, please pipe, pipe up. Uh, actually, Luciana just jumped in. Awesome. Oh, that's right. You had a, a call during that first hour. And I <laughs> unfortunately have to go, but so drop that in and then leave. But um, uh, Drop the bomb and move on. Yeah. I know, and I don't necessarily believe it. I'm just at a low point. Uh, maybe in my desperateness of my optimism. So well, before you go, a couple of things, because I think the thing you were asking about earlier that somebody wanted clarification on the chat was we wanted to put together a larger virtual event for OGM yeah. so we can convene. That's kind of the framing of it. Um, I'm about to, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at this virtual conference, uh, Unfinished, which is hosted out of Romania, uh, which starts September 27th and runs a week. I'm thinking we might actually piggyback onto that conference, our own meetings and participate in that and do something ourselves kind of all at once. I, I, that may be too much of a mix up, but the theme of the conference is trust. Uh, it's really interesting. They've got a bunch of interesting things going on. We can kind of pick and choose. Uh, and if people sort of apply to, to participate, because as opposed to being, you know, I, I don't know yet whether they're live streaming the whole thing, but if we, we, can, if we can participate there, that might be a really interesting and fun place uh, to do what we're trying to do and kind of double up in some interesting and use way. it as a learning context for some of our doing context. Okay, exactly. And that and that'll and that'll create a deadline for us. Sorry, okay, ahead, so Jane. we need objectives and we need a spots. Sorry. Can you repeat the name of the conference? It's in the chat unfinished. Okay, thank you. Quick yep. question. Do you know what platform they're using? Or I don't know, is it like the, the hop into which was really cool? Or that might be they've, they've got they've, they're working with a developer. They've created their own platform called flow. I don't have a link to it right now. I've, I've, I've seen it and tested it. It's actually quite cool. Sounds it, terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yet another platform, but, but it's, it's intriguing. It has a couple of features that I think, uh, I think many of us will like. 
Um, and Luciana, what we just finished doing was a, a quick check-in round, which is like, where are you? What's up in your life? And if you'd like to do that, that'd be, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, thank you for inviting me to participate here. It took, it took me like 10 seconds to connect to what was being discussed in the sense that it was very, very quick to understand that, well, this is, you know, um, even though it's the first time I participate, we are so aligned in, in the purpose, yeah, of what we want to achieve, of building um, really a better future uh, based on trust. Uh, and it, we, we do believe that we can do a lot of stuff together. So um, Jerry and I met through Open EXO uh, Network. And um, I've been a consultant for a while with them. I've worked in business creation. And uh, since January, I've been working on a project which is redefining how we share and discover knowledge. I think in, in that, you know, there are a lot of things that are happening right now that, you know, we, we go to YouTube, to Google, and um, these platforms are not necessarily optimizing for us and they are not providing necessarily the best experience for collaboration, yeah? And I think we are knowledge networks and, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the more, let's say, inviting this environment is to share knowledge, the better it will be for people to thrive and to have autonomy. So I'm happy to tell a bit more about uh, Tether, which is what we are developing. Our company is called Future Playgrounds, you can go to futureplayer.com to see kind of where we're coming from. Uh, but yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And I hope, uh, you know, um, to be many more of these calls and see what we can do together. Thank you, Luciana. And um, in a little bit, I wanted to <clears throat> sort of go back to education as a theme because Lauren and Charles, who are on this call, are working on some stuff that, that you ought to sort of be connected into that I had mentioned to you. Uh, so we'll go there as well. Um, and I was, I, I, I just want to ask a question of the group here because I was on a call yesterday where I asked this question and we were kind of stumped. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a timely question, which is, there's an election coming up in less than 60 days in the US, which is quite pivotal, quite crucial. Besides phone banking, donating, making sure to vote, making sure others vote, talking to family, what else, could, what else should we be doing right this second? And in particular, what might OGM do? Is there a story we might, I, I'm, is there a story we might tell and propagate that would be useful and interesting? So for example, uh, during the primaries before, uh, before it was clear that Biden was going to win, I did a series of videos. I did six out of eight videos about Trump, about how to manage Trump during this re-election cycle. And I'll, put, I'll post a, a link to the playlist uh, in the chat. Um, but uh, I, my intention was always to do you know, video seven and eight, and then the world just like got, got turned upside down. So I could, still, I could still do those videos and build on what I was saying there, which is really like, how do we, how do we interrupt this thing? Because if we're in the middle of an alternate reality game and it's being spun very effectively, and a bunch of people won't vote or will vote for Trump as a result of that, of that like what can we put in the system that will that will change the the course of that of that particular flow, for example. So just that that's probably too much detail because that's the the, the part of the way I'm coming into the question. But let me just ask broadly, um, what might we do that would be really effective? And Pete, you've got the floor. Uh, thanks. I just dropped a link to Daniel's guide to taking action in the election. Um, it's a it's a good guide. Um, I just found it on the web. Um, actually, that's not quite the way to say it, but. Um, I, I, I also want to like throw a flag here. Um, I think it's super important to get involved in the election and to and for everybody to vote their conscience um, uh, like critical. Um, and yet uh, just mechanically and structurally over the from our experiences over the past couple of years of election manipulation, um, thought manipulation, um, the stuff that's going on with Facebook, the stuff that's going on with, you know, uh, uh, um, gerrymandering and the post office and all of that stuff, just structurally, um, it's pretty easy to predict that the vote is going to be contested. Um, and one or the other side can easily manipulate, or maybe not easily, but um, it's entirely possible that one or the other side manipulates the vote one or another way, right? I saw a very persuasive uh, scenario that Trump 
um, a week before the election, tweets that the election is postponed, guys, don't worry about it, we don't have to vote in a week. Um, and he can't do that, can't do that legally. Um, but what that could happen, what that could do is force all of his people not to go to the polls and for him to lose by a landslide. And that creates a, con a, a condition where he can say, guys, this whole election thing was bullshit. And I, you know, Biden may have won by a landslide, but that wasn't true. It didn't happen. And then we get into this weird confluence of, of stuff, right? So no matter which way it goes, um, it's going to be like contested to heck and it's just going to be a nightmare of legal battles and, and political uh, wills, uh, battles of, of public will back and forth and at least until the inauguration, right? If not after. So um, again, it's super critical for everybody to vote and for us to get as many people to vote. Um, uh, and there's a follow on battle we, just because we voted and we won or just because we voted and we lost, that's not the end of the story. That's actually just the beginning of the story. I'm totally agreed. I'm putting some links in the chat. The, the playlist I just mentioned is there as well as a link to <clears throat> that, play, that, that set of videos in my brain where you can see everything that each of the videos is connected to. Um, so you can go through it in that way. <clears throat> Other thoughts on what to do now? Like what uh, Scott mentioned in the chat, let's show that dialogue is possible. I like that idea a whole lot. Um, I think I've mentioned, I'm sure I've mentioned before on these calls that uh, two of my heroes are uh, Daryl Davis and Dia Khan. <clears throat> and Daryl is a black jazz pianist who's got a garage full of KKK robes because he very patiently went and talked with KKK members. <clears throat> and they grew to, to, to trust him and they became friends and they realized you know, his, his, his perennial question is, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Uh, Dia Khan is a Pakistani woman uh, who was a model and a TV uh, anchor and a journalist, I think. And she left Pakistan because it was hideous there for her, went to London. It wasn't that much better. Came to the US, wasn't that much better. Started interviewing white supremacists. And uh, she's the cr creator of the documentary White Right, which is fascinating to watch, fascinating to watch. Um, and that's about conversation. And then there's a, a guy I support on Patreon called, who does a program called Let's Chat. And he'll park himself on a little like card table outside of a church or a mall in some conservative part of town. He's a rhetorician. And he basically asks people, what is something you believe 100% true? Something you are sure is true. And then he'll just start sort of kind of undermining their position through rhetoric. <clears throat> so, so, like, so there's no doubt. Like, so if it, blah, 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 blah. And it's, and it's actually really interesting because he has a respectful conversation. He records the whole thing with two cameras. He's got a little rig that's got high quality audio and video and post those online. That's cool. Um, what else can we do? And, and there's a bunch of really nice links showing up in the, in the chat. Thank you. Other thoughts? Doug? Well, I think in general, it's important for us not to treat the Trump supporters and that group as being stupid. Uh, they have reasons for why they're doing what they're doing, and we need to understand those. We have not done enough work to understand why people support Trump and what they're opposed to, because you can't see their support except in the context of what they don't like. So that's what I did in the sequence of videos that I just put on the chat. It's like, <clears throat> I don't believe that all of Trump's followers are misogynist, homophobic, sexist thugs. I think, in fact, a whole bunch of people voted for him for quite rational reasons, and I try to enumerate them. One of the videos is about Trump's virtues, <clears throat> um, which is a little bit crazy, but it's like, it's like what, do, what does Trump do that you might actually consider to be a virtue? And, and I got, like, one of, one of my favorite examples here is you know, the week after the 2016 election, my buddy Al says, you know, what, 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 if Hillary had won this election, what was she going to do on election, on inauguration day? and I could name nothing. And then he says, what is Trump going to do on Inauguration Day? And I could, I could enumerate his hideous program. And so one of his virtues is through behavioral animal conditioning methods, he is able to teach people stuff and have them repeat stuff. And, and that is a deep media skill, right? And if, you, and if you watch Scott Adams, the author of Dilbert, do analyses of Trump, he will help you realize that from the persuasion community, which is a, another weird subculture, Trump is a black belt, complete and total black belt communicator. And you have to respect that. 
Trump is also able to sort of lie without blinking and consistently. And that's kind of a skill if you're trying to shift the conversation. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a dark vision, but that, that's all um, in the video. And I, I have a lot of, I think I have a lot of compassion for people who feel strongly enough that the system is screwed up that they needed to vote for somebody who's going to shatter the system. That's one of the logics I have for why people would back Trump, because he is a fire ship. And in, in, in the days of sail, a fire ship was basically one of, one of the ships in your fleet, probably an older one that you would load up with tar and pitch and, and, and flammable materials, light it on fire, and then from upwind, shove it into the enemy fleet so that it would you know, make contact with, with enemy ships who were in line of battle and light, light them on fire because it's really hard to prevent something from drifting into you when the wind is your, is your power source. Uh, anyway, other thoughts? Uh, Ken? Uh, and Stacy, you had raised your hand earlier. I was going to echo what Doug yeah. said, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and what Pete was saying about vote your conscience. A lot of people are; <clears throat> they're just not looking at it the way we are. Exactly. Oh, precisely. Uh, Ken, then Mark. Something that doesn't seem to get a lot of um, play in the media is something Lawrence Lessig came up with last year, which is that um, when they survey people. 92% of us are united in saying the government does not work for us, no matter what party affiliation we have, no matter where we stand on the spectrum, there's huge agreement. And um, it's one of the reasons when I went out to see uh, Lessig at uh, Dominican University here, he said he was actually hopeful about this election because he'd never seen such solidarity across political boundaries. However, I think that the current um, uh, media milieu is completely overshadowing, overshadowing that and still managing to divide people. So there is much more unity than we expect, um, but there's, there's a, a concerted effort to make sure that people don't understand that they're unified. And that to me is where, that's a leverage point. If we can figure out how to crack that open. Perfect. If, if we can interrupt that flow somehow, interrupt that narrative, quite, break that narrative, that's, that's, that's like a point of leverage in the system that, that really matters. Thank you, Ken. Um, Mark? Yeah, um, I, I happen to have some uh, friends who are Trumpers. Um, and, and one in particular, let's say prior COVID, um, kept on asking this question. He said, you know, we can be horrified by his discourse and his tweets and, and everything like this. But what, what has really changed in your life since he's president? It's true that, you know, individually, in, as individuals, very little. And I have, I have another friend, and I'm going to read what he, what he wrote to me, uh, actually posted it on, on Twitter. He said, why do I have the feeling the dem establishment doesn't give a crap about the outcome of this presidential election. It's not like Trump is a threat to them, contrary, contrary to the true left. Sorry, say that again, Mark? Um, why do I have the feeling the Dem establishment doesn't give a crap about the outcome of this presidential election? It's not like Trump is a threat to them, contrary to the true left. Yeah, we're, we're in, a, we're in a, a strange moment like that. <clears throat> um, I, mean, I mean, if you, if you look really at, at, at the position today is never Trump, which is not really something that appeals to a lot of people. If you look at the first um, comment from my friend Trumper, um, it's, it, it's not going to change fundamentally what's wrong. It just imply, ampli, amplifying, um, you know, things that have been here for 100, 200, 300 years. That's really not much change there. So do we want change? Do we need change? And how do we go about it? So I think, I think that's one of the pivotal questions. Is, and, and one of the problems is that after the 2016 election, I realized that I had just voted for what I was hoping would be the first woman president of the United States, <clears throat> but that unconsciously I had set aside all of my plans for radical change and design from trust and all the things that I thought needed to be changed in our institutions because I knew that Hillary was gonna be a shepherd of the status quo. And, 
and, and, and that was kind of shattering for me because I was like, damn it, I think we really need deep change. I'm not willing to you know, vote for the fire ship uh, or the hand grenade, but, but we do need thorough change. And one of the dangers right now is that Biden, in order to win, needs to appeal to a whole bunch of people in the middle. And he needs, he needs to peel a whole bunch of conservatives away from the current Republican party. And in order to do that, he can't sort of claim to destroy the system or you know, uh, defund the police. He's got to keep arm's length from that. And I don't even know that he believes that, you know, in that movement. I believe, I, I believe we need to reassign what police does completely and there's a whole story there. But, but I don't think he's going to be that radical. And my fear is that if, if he wins and we go four years of Biden uh, and he does nothing really dramatic, we are going to have Don Trump Jr. as president you know, four years down the road or Ivanka, or something like that. I don't know. But, but, but we actually need thoroughgoing change. And I think that's where the agreement is on, on, you know, on the surveys we just mentioned, <clears throat> is like that the system's broken. Uh, everyone. Yeah, I'm listening to this. It's very interesting, because of course, you're talking about the United States. But what's the reflection of that in Canada, it's not as deeply polarized and not as perhaps deeply dangerous, our, but we have the same thing that goes back and forth, back and forth along sort of two sides of the middle, you know, which is to say people get sick of the liberals and then they vote the conservatives in, and then they get sick of the conservatives and then they vote the liberals in. And we actually do have more than two parties, but the third party and the fourth party never get much more. They don't get a lot of traction at the federal level. And so we just kind of keep oscillating back and forth in a very narrow range and so the basically revolutionary and fundamental changes that need to take place never do take place because that range in the middle is still trying to appeal to, you know, as broad an audience as possible to get reelected instead of saying basically, you know, maybe we're here for a short time, but we're, or, you know, are we here for a short time or a good time? And then just go all out to make the necessary changes, do what needs to be done and risk being, um, thrown out in the next election, but have stuff put into place. That happened in British Columbia back in the early 70s when the NDP, which was like Social Democrat Party, got elected for the first time ever. And they made so many changes so fast and they only served one term, but a lot of those changes are still in place today, 50 years later. Thank you, April. That, that really, um, you're reminding me of a, of a trope I like, which is the difference between big G government and little g governance. And big G government has basically become politics, has basically become consumer mass marketing, um, and has little to do with a, a humans actually sitting down and, and managing their commons and figuring out how to set up policy and, and whatever else. Very little to do with it. And so one of the things I like about OGM, which appears to be sort of a floor wax and a toothpaste and a bunch of other things, uh, is that I consider it a bit of a ground up uh, insurrection on this, because if we could start sharing what we know, debating it properly, making better decisions, and then broadening out that reach, the way Wikipedia kind of ate, you know, the encyclopedia space. But if, but if we can do that for for both discourses involving trust and the fact base that we're all working from, whatever that even means in this era of deep fakes and, and, and mistrust of data, but if we can sort of conquer some of that just through our actions, uh, we have a chance of, in the longer run, creating or provoking, I think, larger scale change. At least I, I have that, that dream. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I, I think that people like us tend to think that knowledge and opinions and policy are really important. I think for a lot of the Trump supporters and people like that, it's the texture of lived life, what you see, uh, the flow of stuff in the supermarket, whatever, that are the persuasive elements, not policy. Um, agreed. And, and one of the strange things here is like belief in COVID as an important thing, not just the seasonal flu, I think fluctuates a lot with whether anybody in your first degree got whacked or has died of it. And that, that tends to wake up a lot of people and they're like, oh crap, this isn't what I thought it was. Um, Charles. Yeah, just to just to mention again, I put in the chat much earlier um, the link to the session from Tuesday, which was over four hours with Tom Atlee. Um, but he went into a lot of depth and detail about dynamic facilitation as it fits into it integrates into his 
one of this kind of handful, a series of, of models of collective sense making. So just to flag that, um, hopefully um, we'll get to do our, our sort of Kiko Lab boiling it down thing, but we haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, it's kind of really amazing and rich and some, some others of us are, who are here were there. So I don't know if anyone wants to fill in, but it's, it's great and it speaks exactly to all of that dialogue and deliberation stuff. And if somebody wanted to summarize, summarize that and put it back into the conversation, I would love that. First though, Phelan, and you're muted. No, you kind of touched up on what I was thinking about in hearing you riff a little bit that, like, yeah, definitely there seems to be an insurgency against the middle going on. And it's definitely pointing to a need for evolution. seem to be converging has to kind of like find their way back out in some different kind of configuration and um my question is this if it is about framing and we do have to frame like everything from the from the bottom up um And, and, and knowledge itself is at risk here. Knowledge itself is being questioned. You know, knowledge itself is being questioned. The, 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 the apparatus that's holding all of it is being questioned. Um, where do we start? So one of my fears is that post-truth is not like a four or 10 year detour, but a 200 year era. So we have the enlightenment, we have science, we have a bunch of stuff, and then shit hits fan and we get romanticism and we get much more political twisting and all other kinds of stuff. And our, our faith in humans as able to fix these things and maybe do stuff and that science will, technology will, will you know, uh, create the leisure society or whatever, just kind of goes away. We, we lose that faith. And we get a whole bunch of stuff that we're still living through today. So I'm really concerned that truth loses its grasp on us entirely and that for 200 years we we're sort of at the at the mercy of people who have good narrative uh that mostly plays off fear and that this uh, successfully drives enough crowds to take democracy in whatever uh strange directions they would like to take it and i don't i don't think that's a far-fetched scenario um but but that's kind of the the, the time span that i'm worried about <clears throat> because if we can do something to sort of anchor facts again and come back to it, and, and at the same time, I hold this very conflicted point of view, which is that emotion and membership trumps logic most of the time. That I can have the most beautiful, crisp argument in front of you with the best visualization ever, the big, beautiful visualization with indisputable facts, the recorded and, and certified and digitally notarized. And if agreeing with my, my argument means leaving your tribe, or being, you know, being ostracized from your community, you will happily ignore my facts. <clears throat> and so, the, so OGM is trying, is trying really hard to hold both of those things. How do we perfect the visualization and representation of, of, of argument often as story? And how do we ignore the tech and ignore the, the logic and, and, and actually approach people and have um, uh, meaningful uh, sort of conversations where we are more permeable to each other um, in, a, in our points of view and, and where we don't, don't look down on each other, where we're respectful and, and can hold that. All of which is happening at a moment where um, some parties have figured out that intentionally destroying that capacity is a great victory plot, right? So there's like, there's like multiple layers of crap here that, that I'm trying to describe that, that we're living through. We're, we're actually living through that right this second. Charles, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, just kind of fascinating. That, um, thing to bring up as a, as a kind of worst case scenario of this 200 year flash that you had and just, just pursuing that in a tiny sliver here. Um, so you had it, the, the thought came with a, a kind of time frame and, a, and a, an end point. So I'm, I just kind of flashed on, well, what is it that got us out of that then 200 years later? What could it be? And, and could we kind of just really go there? Well, well, my yeah, my mental model of history is that every now and then some big things happen, which just sort of 
bend history. And, and one of the reasons I'm totally fascinated with Carl uh, uh, Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, is because he's describing the bend from pre-industrial society in, into industrial society. And one of the many interesting things he says is that industrial, uh, industrial uh, uh, tech, uh, economy requires industrial society, by which he means once we started shifting into industry, we needed lots of free labor, we needed lots of free land, we needed, we needed sort of the market economy to dominate so that everybody would be available, which meant uh, that this new market and industrial economy had to be like a cuckoo bird. You know, a cuckoo chick pushes all the other eggs out of its nest. <clears throat> it, it couldn't have people thrive in communities that were on the commons, that were, you know, having a great time staying alive, that it had to destroy them systematically because everybody needed to be available as free labor. And so um, it's a small digression, but in the early days of Western expansion, a lot of frontiers people ran across and joined the Native American tribes. They were like, man, life is much better over there. And we, we you know, they may be under attack from us, but there, were, there was a whole lot of jumping across and going and joining the Native tribes um, for better or worse. Um, so, so how do we figure that out? And then we're getting close to the end of our, of our call time. Um, uh, Rob, you had mentioned earlier in the chat something that I'd love to just sort of uh, go into a little bit more, which is like over attributing to Trump <clears throat> the mess that we're in about COVID. And I've got a ton of stuff in my brain about the mistakes that Trump actually made, the like, and, and, and sort of things like that. But but I realize that that's a really important sort of uh, debate point. So I don't want to just sort of gloss over it here. Uh, so maybe we set up a different conversation around it or something like that. Just, uh, just one yeah. sentence on it, I think comes Please. more from kind of the, maybe the libertarian uh, uh, group of folks that think that whatever the government touches makes it worse. And so um, to, to say that there was you know, we're all humans with free choice, so we could have chosen to wear masks or chosen to isolate ourselves. Obviously, there's a big component of him having the bully pulpit and and putting that information out there. But I think there's a lot that that can be done, was done, could have been done at the local levels. You know, a lot is done at the state levels. So yes, he has a lot of sway, but we also all have collective responsibility for, for the world and the people. So that would be the summary of the point. Agreed. Um, Stacy, then Pete, if you had something you wanted to yeah, add. I, I just want to add that focusing on what he may have done wrong, it's like we want people to see that, you know, they made a mistake, but we're doing it with shame. You know, mm -hmm. you idiot, you fell for this. And I think it's much more important to just focus on what we want going forward, where we are united, how we do want to deal with it and take him out of the equation because he is a cult figure at this point. Uh, really good point. And it's one I wrestle with constantly. Like I can't make my way past that. And it, when I talk about things like design from trust, I'm completely torn because my own belief still is unless you understand how the sausage was made before, like unless you understand where that went wrong, you're going to rebuild that same sausage. You're going to like, you're going to go back into it because it's a groove. It's a, it's a set of assumptions that we're accustomed to. So you have to kind of go through history and expose some of the, the, the ways that things got, this is my own logic. And, and yet, and yet talking about what, what is the positive thing we could do together right now is the better approach for bridging this, this big divide. Without sounding arrogant, though, I just want to say that there's a whole bunch of people that will never be able to understand all those levels anyway. So we're trying to explain to them they can't get it, you know, and, you know, on all sides, you know, and I'm not putting any other assumptions on that. I'm with you. Thank you. Uh, Pete, do you want to have a, a wrapping? Uh, Pete and then Judy. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is a kind of a question, it's a, a OGM meta question um, and uh, also an OGM forum thing. Um, uh, in these kind of groups, uh, in social settings, uh, we often have a, a bright line 
um, uh, about no commerce, no, no commercial stuff. This is a safe place. This is a place away from the helter skelter world of, of money and, and things like that. So I want to suggest, or I want to ask maybe, um, I want to, I, I have an intuition. Um, I have an intuition that it wouldn't hurt us and it would help us if there was a little bit of commerce uh, in OGM. Um, so to start off, I, you know, the, the way I think of this is kind of just practically, oh, it would be super cool if there was on the OGM forum, if there was a help wanted section and a help offered section and a stuff, offer, uh, stuff wanted section and a stuff uh, wanted offered section. Um, and, and it might be okay if there was actually some money attached to that. So it might be okay if I said, you know, uh, I need, uh, I need a, a calculator, a certain kind of calculator from 10 years ago. I wonder if you've got one rattling around in your closet, I would be happy to pay you $25 for it. Conversely, I've got, you know, this uh, really cool book that you can't buy anymore. Um, I, I want to give it to somebody, except I think if, if I give it to somebody, they won't value it as much as if I ask for $10 for it. Maybe it's a $100 book. Maybe it's a $10 book. I don't know. Um, I, I also have a, a use case, immediate use case for the help wanted section. Um, one of the things I have the dream of doing for OGM forum, and I haven't had the time to do it, is um, it would be super nice if I or somebody else uh, took every week kind of a, a snapshot, looked over at OGM forum and said, here's all the stuff that's going on at OGM forum and you're missing out if you don't kind of look around, you know. Um, uh, I wish I had time to do that. I don't. Um, and it popped in my head. Um, I would totally say, and this, this is an unequal commercial thing and it's weird, but I would totally say, look, I would pay somebody, I, here's, here's a $50, you know, thing I'll put into, uh, uh, into whatever payment system we need to put it into, uh, square or, or, uh, whatever. Um, if you, if you did four or five weeks of taking an hour of your time and going through OGM forum and saying, look, this is the top stories. This is, I'm, I'm a kind of a beat reporter for OGM forum. Um, I would totally give you 10 bucks a week for, you know, five weeks. I, I can put out 50 bucks into the world for that. I would love that. I would hope that some other people would go, dude, I'll chip in for that too, because I need that service. I need it as well. And I want it to go past five weeks past um, Pete's $50, but um, so that's my um, suggestion, wish, question. So let me answer Pete directly and then pass it to Judy for the last word and we'll wrap the call. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I'm totally on board. I think yes. And there's several things that we've been trying to do to do this. So number one, story threading is a, a job capacity, a new role that we're trying to create, which would be a paid role. There would be a guild that would sort of uh, bring uh, story threaders up into capacity. We would sell our services to corporations, to organizations, to governments, whoever. And hopefully that's a, that's a commercial venture that's ongoing. Um, second, uh, Matt and the team at Co uh, Collective Next have been trying really hard to close uh, a, a client project that would actually involve OGM and where some OGMers would get paid to be part of the project, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been a couple near misses, but none of those have actually closed yet. Um, I'm actually in a conversation right now, actually a couple of conversations where that might happen as well. Uh, and I'm just dying for one of those to come in. And then third, um, uh, this isn't framed up yet and probably we have to be a bit of a, more of a business, like either, a, a, I don't really wanna become a nonprofit or 401c3, but a public benefit corporation would be great, but we need to have some kind of structure because I'd like to create a reservoir for money that organizations that want what we're doing to, to thrive in the world to pour some, some money into, which we would then divide among OGM fellows. And OGM fellows would be people who, as Pete just described, have given a lot of time and effort to OGM and that, that funding would allow them to not worry so much about uh, rent, you know, rent food or whatever and be able to continue offering some effort here. So all of those things are kind of in the air in the offing, aren't, aren't facts yet, aren't done yet, but that's, and that's just the start. And I'm totally open to other kinds of ideas, including like swap meet and whatnot. And we've got a bunch of hands up. So, so quickly, Phelan, then Lauren, then Judy. I don't know if you guys have actually started to have conversations about that before. I like the idea of the guild um, framing. You know, uh, I, I know Lauren and Charles deals with 
deal with it a lot within their hash bins. Um, and then, but like if there was a way that we can actually look at governance, look at and break down, like how is it that we might kind of have a, 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 a framework that people can kind of adapt in terms of business, best practices and, and push that along. Um, yes, 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 yes. I just typed into the chat that <clears throat> there will be a call probably next week about exactly that topic. Okay. So it'll be separate from our check-in call. We'll, we'll have a, a call about what does a guild mean in the OGM context? How do we do it? Uh, what, what should we expect of guilds? What are some of the guilds we can set up at the beginning, et cetera? So uh, totally on board with that. Um, Lauren and then Judy for the last word. Thanks, Hank. I just wanted to say that um, maybe OGM isn't um, a specific entity as much as a flotilla of things and that it could actually be united by uh, like crappy brand. And in fact, we probably need crappy brand better than like shiny brand uh, to unite everyone. Jerry, are you you're muted? No, go ahead. I'm talking to April. I'm, I'm having a side conversation. My apologies. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, it could be that we already have uh, companies registered, and maybe, for example, say if we were to get uh, grant money or something, uh, it would be nice if we had like a whole list of choices of different entities for different grants or different um, uh, co-ops or we, uh, Charles and I have both a nonprofit and a DAO um, and maybe there are other entities among us that would be really helpful to use to not have to do paperwork every time in order to do anything so that we could kind of reduce the amount of bureaucracy needed to do anything. Thank you, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, Judy, uh, you've got the last word. Well, I don't know that it's the last word, but it occurs to me that we're putting a lot of emphasis in this particular call on the importance of the election, which I totally agree with for many, many reasons. However, elections are notoriously fickle. And so there's another dimension of how do we plow ahead regardless of the new reality that we probably need to spend some significant time contemplating. What are the continuing actions that will make the world a better place regardless of how chaotic the political scene is. And given that we're going to factor in political craziness as a higher threshold than it has historically been, what are the implications of that for how we act inside that umbrella, so to speak, or at the edge of the umbrella to work the fringes to change the umbrella? And um, I totally, totally agree with that too. And I think what OGM is doing is extremely valuable in either scenario, whoever wins. I would just rather be working in the, frankly, Biden one scenario than in the Trump one scenario because the, the latter one is much more difficult. So, so, many, so many things are going to be harder. Um, all right, which is a slightly sort of bittersweet note to end on, but I think that uh, that's a good, a good spot to hold this. Um, thank you all. Uh, go on the mailing list, go on the forum, and let's talk about these things. Uh, see you in a week, and I'm going to set up a couple of extra side calls about some of these different topics. Uh, so thank you very much. Really lovely, lovely sharing all this with you all. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Bye, y'all. Meet you all.